Well, good evening. Everybody got quiet, so it must be time for me to start. Uh, so good to be with y'all. Uh, look forward to this, uh, continuing this study. We're talking in here in the auditorium this four-week period on the topic of defending my faith. And the idea, the approach we're taking is not so much a formulaic, if this comes up, do this, if this comes up, do this, but, but just looking more at the, at the whole notion of defending our faith. And, and uh, so we're going to continue to look at that tonight. Um, I guess there are some announcements I just found up here. Um, we're still in need of adult chaperones for the junior and senior high lock-in on August 3rd and 4th. Please see Matthew or Kelly Morgan or a psychologist if you'd like to help. <laughs> this Saturday, our back to school Devo will take place at the building from four to six. Um, food will be provided. And there will be an elders and deacons and ministers meeting this Sunday at 3.30 p.m. As we enter into our class, let's bow for a word of prayer together. Father, we are so grateful for this evening, for the beauty of this day, and for the beautiful occasion in which we can be assembled together and to study from your word. We are so grateful that we have your word to base our faith upon. We are asking, Lord, that you will bless us in our study so we can come to know your word better, be better equipped uh, to live according to your will and to share knowledge of your will with those that, that we meet, those that are our friends and our family. We pray that you will bless um, them through us. We ask that you would help us to be prepared for those moments, those opportunities to be watching for you know, opportunities to speak uh, truth and to gently uh, guide others to a knowledge of that truth. We thank you, Father, for the salvation that comes through this truth, the gospel of Christ Jesus. We thank you so much that he was willing to come and, and teach us and to live out a perfect example of obedience to your will and to carry out that obedience all the way to the cross. We thank you that you glorified him by raising him from the dead, giving us hope of resurrection. Father, we are so grateful that we have hope. We know that there is a better life, uh, the perfect life that is to come. And as we endure difficulties in this life, we pray that you will help us to cope with those things that trouble us, give us peace. Pray that you will bless those who are struggling with health problems among us. We know that there are many who are hurting and suffering various ways. We pray your hand will be with them. Ask that you be with uh, Mary Alice Harwell as she's dealing with her health problems and ask that you grant her recovery and, and health. We ask that you would be with all of those who are sick from our congregation, our friends and those we care about. And we know that you have the power to, to heal and comfort and we thank you for that. And we thank you that you have expressed to us that you want to know the things that bother us and want to know, want us to be asking for for your intervention and for your hand to be involved and we pray that you will be involved in those situations. We ask that you would bless our study tonight and help us to be the light we should be. In Jesus' name, amen. Last time we were um, asking a question before whom do we defend our faith? Who, who is going to challenge us on our faith? Who is it that we're going to have these faith discussions with? Who are we going to be answering, giving an answer to uh, in regard to the things that we trust, the, the truth that we believe? And just very quickly, and, and I meant to finish all this, so I'm going to kind of keep a, a, a faster pace throughout the rest of this material until I get to where I meant to start. Um, very briefly recapping what uh, we talked about last time, we're in an increasingly multicultural society. People that have a very different religious perspective 
sometimes you know a completely different religion altogether that we are are encountering in our daily lives uh, and so obviously we have um, opportunities to defend our faith our knowledge of the truth um, when when these people ask when these people um, approach us about or when we approach them about um, differences in the way we believe uh, we have uh, we defend our faith before people who uh, believe in Jesus but have a very different faith and practice of that faith. Uh, not everybody, obviously, who believes, who claims to be a follower of Jesus, believes the same thing. We don't have everything in common in our faith with those who claim the same faith. And um, that provides us opportunity to, um, as Aquila and Priscilla did, to show the way more accurately to those who would disagree with us on certain points of our faith. Uh, we are in a society that increasingly denies truth and rejects authority. We have opportunities to um, defend faith, and sometimes we're subjected to a defense of the faith in the view of those who question whether you know, we have any, or our Lord has any authority over them, whether the, the, the Bible has authority over them. More and more, it seems, uh, deny that the Bible has that kind of authority over them. We. I could just talk louder, too, I guess. Okay, very good. Okay, well, all right. Maybe I should move it up even farther. Be right up in my name. Um, fourthly, uh, sometimes we have to defend our faith to people who have been hurt by people who have claimed to be Christians before or seen uh, Christianity used as a means to enrich you know, people's pocketbooks and bank accounts and, and have come to view Christianity with skepticism. Sometimes that's going to be, be upon us to defend true faith in the view of those who have maligned the Christian faith. So a couple more groups that you may find yourself defending faith uh, before. Um, worldly people. People who are engrossed in the things and pursuits of this world. And why... <laughs> Why would you have to defend your faith in, in, in the view of, of somebody who is living by their own desires, their own pleasures, seeking to satisfy every carnal desire that they have? Why would, why would there be any conflict there? What? And, and do we necessarily have to bring up, do we have to point out to them, hey, what you're doing isn't, isn't right in every case? I mean, so obviously we have the duty to proclaim righteousness. But sometimes just living a righteous life is enough to cause people to question why you, do, why you don't join them. Uh, Peter addresses this in the same book where he's, or the same letter in which he's talking about being prepared to give an answer. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Forever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. Just because you don't participate with the world, you're making a statement to them. A statement to them that makes them uncomfortable. 
that makes them want to challenge you when you don't join them, when you don't give them your explicit approval. And participation in it with them is approval. And that's what they're looking for. from you. They want you to join with them because it makes them feel accepted and not judged, not condemned. Bill. And you, and you tell them that they really can't afford that. You know, you look like you can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the effect is pretty much the same. <laughs> I don't think you make friends either way. I, I think that's, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> and they can't conceive of that, can they? They can't conceive that that's actually a better life than what they're experiencing because they're trying to satisfy every desire that they have and not find, finding satisfaction in it. Um, finally, and again, moving on, um, Probably the group that you will most find yourself defending your faith over, unless you're friends, unless you live in that, that small percentage of us who are, are totally insular, totally isolated when it comes to your faith. Your, your friends are all church members. Your, your, your family is all church members. Your friends and your family that have a difference with you in what you believe, you will most likely be challenged by them when it comes to your faith. Particularly if you have changed who you are over the course of your relationship with them. Philip. I think it's both. I think the defense gives us, gives us an opportunity to expose whoever's asking to the truth. And I think that's, that's uh, and it, it's exactly that. It's an opportunity. But it's also strengthening us. You know, it, it, we come away from those kind of encounters either desiring to, to study more and, and grow more so we have a better answer and learn from that experience and, and be prepared even more the next time or, or we, we come away you know, confident because of the answer we were able to give. But either way, it's, it's, it's edifying self, but it's also giving opportunity to the, to the one who's on the other side of the uh, discussion, hopefully. And, and one of the things I was going to get to, or I hope to get to, really was supposed to get to last week and really need to get through with, but um, we don't always need, we don't need to have the expectation that we're always going to win the argument. We're always going to come out with this satisfied feeling that it went just exactly right. That I, I don't, I, I think that's, a, you're living in a dream world if you think that every conversation you have is going to end up roses. Uh, the person's going to be going to go away, you know, won, won over by your by your arguments or or by the truth that you present. I, I I don't think that's a realistic expectation at all. And and if if we understand that going in, I think that that helps prepare us 
for that outcome because that's probably going to be the case more often than not. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. But um, somebody else have something? Or... Exactly. That, that's right. And, and sometimes that's done just a, a half step at a time. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and I, those are the kind of things I want to talk about in, in the next question. How, we, how, do we be, how are we effective at defending our faith? I want to look at some points to that. Well, and certainly we can defend Christianity in an unchristian way. I mean, sometimes we, we can... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. They, they equate their own mindset with the mindset of Christ. I, you know, they think, they've, I've got the mind of Christ. If you agree with me, you're being Christ-like, you're, you know, then... Yeah. Right, right. Yes, cooperative. They equate equate cooperation with with Christianity. Right, accepting or yes, yes. Yes, certainly. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it's happening more and more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it happens in in the great the great. Yes, exactly. The, the great moral question of the day, homosexuality, is, oh, well, that's, that's so unloving of you to have that for that attitude. And so they equate, you know, acceptance with love, which is not the case at all. <laughs> Y'all are just prepping me. You're just like throwing softball so I get on to the next point, what you're doing. When Jesus, getting back to the question of defending your faith in, in terms of friends and family... Did Jesus come and say, look, I, I'm going to have some things for, for you here, but I certainly don't want to disrupt anybody's home life or anybody's peace that they have in their home. And Is that the way that Jesus approached his teaching? What, what did he say instead? I didn't come to bring peace, peace between people. I came to bring a sword. And that sword is cutting to the point, the closest relationships that we have within the family, fathers and children, mothers and, 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 and sons, and mothers and daughters, and you know, brothers and sisters. You know, he's dividing, he's, he's separating. The message that he has sometimes does that. And he's not intending to preserve peace in the family if it puts you on the other side of peace with God. And sometimes we have to, we're going to have to make the choice to side with God rather than have peace with our, our family. And they're going to question why we do that. Adriana. Right, yeah, yeah, and, and and that's the. I mean, it's it's hurtful when it happens. Certainly, we don't want that to happen. 
But again, your relationship with God matters more than any human relationship that you have, and, and, and that's where we have to put our priority. However that sword cuts, we've got to, we've got to make sure we're on the right side of that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had those conversations. I've had people call me and say, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, we're talking marriage, and what would you, what would you say to this person? And, and it's, it hurt, it's hurt, hurt sometimes to have to tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're, you'll find. Yeah, you'll you'll find acceptance for pretty much any any kind of behavior, any kind of circumstance, in some sort of group. Um, don't know that you're going to find acceptance with God on that point. That's 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 uh, that's another question. So how? How do, what's required for our defense, defense of our faith to be effective, successful? What, what kind of things have to be in place? And again, this isn't a, hey, here's, the, here's a list of an, ready answers for you know, the questions. You know, some people make those. This isn't intended to be one of those kinds of classes or discussions. Um, I just put together a, a list of about eight things, things that really need to be a part of your mindset, really need to be a part of your approach when you deal with somebody on matters of your faith, when there's conflict in faith, conflict in a, a view of faith. And the first is that we use and refer to and s exclusively use the Word of God. It is, it is the basis of faith. Faith comes through hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. And that is where faith comes from. If you want to have a discussion about faith, you must go to the word of God. There is no other source. There is no other reference that you can... I mean, yeah, you can... You can there, there are godly men who've written godly books and based on the Bible and, and those things are useful, but the final authority on faith is the Word of Christ. It's the Word of God. We have to become uh, reliant upon it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, uh, we, give, uh, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the Word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. You will never convert somebody to Christ if they aren't converted by the word of God. They're not going to be converted by your opinion. They're not going to be converted by your view of religion, your view of faith. If people are going to be converted to your faith, they will have the faith that derives from this word as the word of God. And understand it to be God's definitive message to them, what he intends for their life. Brother Tom. And it's not your opinion about those things. You can just point to this is what God's word says about those topics, about those truths. And, and all you can do in, those, in a lot of cases is just let the word speak. The most effective thing that you can do, in fact, is to let the word speak for itself. And the answer not come from you, but from, you know, from God on, on a 
take the top. Talking last night with one of our caretakers, and uh, she used to be a member of the Huntsville Bible Church. That sounds great. And I said, well, I got something to feed you with that. I pulled it out of the library, and it said, the articles of faith and constitution of the Bible Church. I said, why don't you just leave all that off? They put in there and just be the Bible Church. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, that's that's pervasive. It's a pervasive idea in the in the religious world that we can dictate our terms aside from what God's word says to says to do. And and if but we have to convince people, it's not us speaking. This is this is God speaking. Uh, secondly, uh, we must accurately handle. We have to use it fairly, use it in context, use it not taking it out of context, not trying to manipulate the word, and and being convicted by the same message that we're proclaiming to other people. Uh, We we must rightly divide the word. I think that's all those concepts are involved in that. Letting the word speak to us as well as to them. Philip. Using the sort of biblical model, you know, when Paul is chastising Peter for abandoning the Gentiles, you know, how can you <laughs> convince other people to live like Jews when you're living like a like a Gentile? And you know, you've got to live the the life that you're calling people to to live, the truth that you're calling people to live by. And and yeah, yeah, if if they're if you're saying one thing and doing something else, that's you know, your words are not going to do any good. You're an ineffective spokesman for the, for the word, for the faith. Thirdly, you'll be effective when you um, have the attitude of respect and concern for the one you're studying with. Um, remember Ephesians chapter 6, we are, <laughs> our enemy is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is not the person you're engaged in the discussion with. Those aren't the enemy. What we want for them is for them to come to the knowledge of the truth. When it, some of Paul's most bitter opponents were the Jewish leadership. The Jews who were just as he was as Saul of, uh, as, of Tarsus, diametrically opposed to the purposes of Christ. You know, those were among his chiefest opponents What does he say about them in Romans chapter 10, verse 1? Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. He never lost sight of that. No matter the conflict, no matter the the, the level of intensity of the debate or the discussion, he never lost the desire for their salvation. That's an attitude that we need to keep in mind as we have discussions um, we are to you know, as, as Peter says when you make that answer when you give that answer when you make your defense you do it with in what way what two words did he use with gentleness and respect the opposite of those two with harshness and a demeaning attitude are some of the quickest ways to shut down any further conversation, any further persuasion you may have with that person. You do it with a gentle attitude, a respectful attitude. You will 
go much farther at persuading. Even though it's not apparent. Even though it may not be immediately apparent. It will certainly be a better way to answer. A more fruitful way to answer. Fourthly, through having confidence that the truth of God will prevail. Sometimes we're worried about losing the fight, losing the argument. You can't lose when you're speaking from the Word. It always wins. It always is going to win. And it doesn't matter how it's attacked, it doesn't matter how it's opposed, a faith that is based on the Bible will always triumph. Because God's Word stands. We need to remember that sometimes. I need to remember that sometimes. We can remember that there have been great minds and great thinkers and those who have studied intensely and those who have really dug into the Word and they come to the same conclusions that you and I come to when we read this Word. And there have been powerful minds and very determined opponents to this word and they have attacked it in every conceivable way and they always lose. They never win. It helps to remember that. Fifth, through honest and sincere discussion. Honesty and sincerity. It goes hand in hand with gentleness and respect. Be honest with the word. Don't. I heard of a young man who was, who was, shall we say, trying to uh, <laughs> dramatize his position, trying to pretend he was had a certain view or had a certain way of thinking, so he could engage in a conversation. And then he suddenly, he, so he sprung the trap. So you could trap somebody into saying, aha, I've, 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 I've trapped you, and now you've said that, and, and now I win. How effective do you think that was? <laughs> to, to, to play that ruse, to, to, to be something that you weren't. All it does is convince somebody that you're shady and dishonest. If you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. So let's study it together. Let's study it further. I want to know the answer too. I want to know what God's Word says about that too. Let's study it together. Be honest if you don't know the answer. And have confidence that whatever God's Word says, it's okay to do that. <laughs> it's okay to go that direction. Um, along those lines, and, and, and somebody asked, you know, or said... You, It'd be good if you could, you know, maybe offer some suggestions on how you engage in these kind of conversations and, and, and bring up these, this, this discussion of faith. And, and along the lines of, of this, I was, I was thinking about that. And one of the things I think that we don't do particularly well, because we always anticipate that people are going to ask us the question. If you think about Jesus' ministry in his life, Jesus was a question asker. Jesus had all the answers. But you ever notice how many times Jesus asked the question? In Luke chapter 2, when Jesus is 12 years old and he's in the temple, his parents are frantically looking for him. And he's, <laughs> they, they, they search all over Jerusalem looking for him after three days. They find him in the temple and he's doing what? He is listening to the, the scholars, the, the scribes, the ones who are teachers of the law, and he is doing what? He is asking questions. And the next verse says, and they were surprised to hear his answers. Jesus at 12 has the answers but he's asking the question. When 
the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees have done all they can to try to shake Jesus up, trying to get him off on something that's going to get him in trouble. And they've come up with scenario after scenario and question after question. How does Jesus end the conversation? Well, Matthew chapter 22, he asks a question. Who is, whose son is the Christ? Who do you say that, whose son is he? Oh, he's the son of David. Why then does David call him Lord? And they didn't know how to answer that. You see, Jesus knows the answer, but Jesus is getting thought going by asking the question. I think there's a skill in it. There's a, there's a talent to that. I think it would serve us well if we would learn to ask the questions. Right. Yeah, I, um, years ago there was, uh, um, I can't remember his name now, he came here and did some Bible study class. He said, when I go out and I do this study, and he had this, this sheet of, you know, kind of a diagram of, of study he likes to go through. He says, I always ask them to use their Bible. Look, at, look these verses up in whatever Bible they have, Catholic Bible, whatever. And, and because they'll trust what they own. They'll trust the word that they're, and, and it'll say, it'll say the same thing. Good point, dude. Um, six. I've got to at least get through what I was supposed to get through last week. I mean, I, I'd be... <laughs> through understanding, and this is something I made a point to say earlier, through understanding that we will not always have observably positive results. You're not going to come away from every conversation about your faith having felt like you won the game. You scored. You just put it, you had the perfect comeback, you had exactly, you, you had all the verses and, and all, you know, they just came to you like it was on a Rolodex and you just played them all out there. You played all the cards right. You're not going to come away from every discussion of faith with that feeling. I guarantee it. You may feel like you lost in the conversation. You may feel like you're getting nowhere in the conversation. You may feel like you've gone backwards with the discussion you just had. You don't know. That may have planted a seed. Whatever you've said, whatever, however you've defended your faith, if you've done it sincerely and with love, that's what Ephesians chapter 4 says. We, are, we proclaim the, the truth with love, speaking the truth with love. If you do that with honesty and integrity in the message and gentleness and respect in your manner, you may have an effect on them that they will remember. And it may not, it may never lead anywhere. But it might. Years down the road, under another circumstance, they may come to view what you've said, the kind of discussion that you've been engaged in, and you may have an influence on them that you can't even perceive, you can't even conceive of in the present. Seventh, through having the courage to make mistakes and risk being scoffed at. How many of, how many of us disengage from any conversation about our faith because we're afraid we're gonna, not going to know the answer? We're going to come away being laughed at. Sharing your faith makes you vulnerable. It's one of the most vulnerable things. It's one of the most sensitive things that we have. It's, it's so deeply personal. It's our identity. It's who we are. It's who we have shaped ourselves after. It's the truth that we have conformed ourselves to. It's very much our identity. 
and to defend that faith. It puts us on the line. It exposes us. And that's tough to do. I'll guarantee you it's tough to do. It's tough for me to do. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that. it's so hard to get there. When you're feeling so exposed. But remember, Jesus told people the truth and they ridiculed him. And they crucified him. Well, Daryl's probably going to cut off my mic. Um, but I'm going to say one more just to get through with what I was supposed to get through last time. With a prayerful mind. Be prayerful. When you're about to engage in a discussion of faith, when you're about to expose your faith to somebody else, be praying. God hears. God answers. That's all I have my time. I have time for tonight. Thank you so much for your kind attention.
good evening, everyone. I want to thank Randy for he said, being out tonight to give me this opportunity. So uh, we have a plethora of uh, men at this congregation that can get up here and do a good job, and he was foolish enough to choose me. So y'all get to deal with that, not him. Something that has, I promised Daryl I would lock in and not migrate around the not podium, I'm sorry. Um, some stories that's been floating around here lately was around June 23rd, there was the coach of, and I want to mispronounce this, the Mupai. We would call those the wild boars. Um, they were a soccer team. You all may have seen this. This is over in Thailand. It was a Thai soccer team. Well, their head coach had an appointment one day on June 23rd, and he left a 25-year-old assistant in charge. Well, the, the assistant coach took 12 of those young men to a cave system. And this is kind of a tradition with them as the story is unfolding, is they would go in and they would have an initiation where they would travel into the depths of this cave and they would sign their names on the, on the back walls and you know, they're going through all this cave system. Well, about 7 o'clock that night, the head coach looked at his phone and he realized he had about 20 missed phone calls from parents who wondered where their little boys were you know, and were worried about it. He called up the assistant coach and couldn't get an answer. He called up other members of the team, couldn't get an answer. He called one 13-year-old boy who didn't make the tri trip with him. And the boy told the coach that the team had gone exploring in that cave system. So the coach went there immediately and discovered their bags, their backpacks, all at the entrance of the cave, and water seeping out of it. This was monsoon season. Very dangerous to go spelunking in this time of, in the monsoon season because the waters will rise, they'll trap you, they'll drown you, all kinds of bad things happen. Well, the 12 boys and their coach ventured into this cave, and after the group entered, it started to rain hard. Floodwaters you know, get, were sent into the mouth of this cave. Monsoon flooding blocked the group's exit route. So they kept walking in until they found a space that was slightly elevated and dry. And this is where they remained stuck. The waters kept rising, and then they kept having to go deeper and deeper into this cave. A large-scale rescue operation, which is where the news this is where the news kind of picked up, and we kind of picked up on the story, was launched, and you involved specialists from Australia, China, Japan, the UK, the United States, but all the while the rains made it exceedingly difficult for them to find the group. Now remember, this started on June 23rd. On July the 2nd, two divers found them alive, and began the rescue operation that didn't complete until July the 10th. It was a happy ending. All 12 boys and the coach were saved, except for one thing. One of the rescue divers drowned, searching for them, trying to help save them. And as I was catching these stories, you know, catching up on the news and reading historicals online about, from various news sources, you know, there are a lot of spiritual lessons that I was, that they were, they were you know, popping to, you know, go, coming to my head, bouncing around that empty space. And, but, they, you know, a lot of things about like how sin, you know, there were warning signs. You know, this is monsoon season. There were signs posted. They knew that the, the rainwaters could come and could trap them and it was dangerous, but yet they went in anyway. You know, how oftentimes do we, we know that something's a sin, but we continue to flirt with it. We continue to see how close to it we can get. We continue to try to get close to it. You know, that was something that popped into my mind, but I didn't really want to go down that path. Um, also, my mind, and the thought of my mind was, the cost of sin. Yes, this was a happy ending, almost. You know, 12 young men, very, you know, 11 you know, to 17-year-old boys were rescued along with their 25-year-old assistant coach, but at the cost of a volunteer diver. So sin has a cost. But again, that bounced around in my empty, empty mind a little while, but what, got, what I kept coming back to was how dark that must have been how hopeless it must have been and how scary that must have been. When I was a younger man back in high school, we went on a trip to one of the local cave systems. I don't remember which one it was. It was Cumberland or I don't even remember now. It's been so long. But I remember it was part of the tour. They shut the lights off. And if you've ever been inside a cave, the, the lights shut off, you don't really understand how dark dark is. It's one of those things where you can punch yourself in the face and you won't see it coming. I mean, it's, you can't see anything. 
And these boys were in this cave. Again, they went in on June 23rd. And they didn't see the diver until July 2nd. How dark it must have been, how difficult it must have been to maintain their hope, to maintain their spirit, to not lose it. You know, the, these boys were together and they trusted one another and they had hope. We, as Christians, are most blessed. You know, no matter how dark, no matter how dangerous, no matter how deadly the world turns against us, turns, you know, the world can turn upside down. We are blessed because we have a loving God and a loving Father. You know, we, we can trust the Lord in our dark times, no matter how terrifying and scared and apprehensive and all those other words we might feel. When all the hope appears to be gone, and we can always turn to our Bibles. And I've turned to the book of Psalms, and I'm just going to, I picked out a handful of Psalms. Psalm 16, verse 11. This is all coming from the ESV. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalms 23, the 23rd Psalm. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalms 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalms 43, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And I'm, this one, when I, when, I, when I read this one, this one really, really got to me. 46, Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3. Especially in the light of what I just read about these stories, these boys. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into this heart of the sea, and though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. And just emphasis. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Wow. During all that, God is our refuge and our strength. You know, as time progresses on, I'm fairly certain there will be a retelling of events of those young men. You know, th what happened between June 23rd through July the 10th, when you know the final young boy and the coach were finally rescued. You know, I'm, I'm sure though, I'm sure it'll be a, a story of how they're rescued from the darkness and certain death. Well, we have a wonderful promise, and it's not a fairy tale; it's a true story. We have the story of God that no matter what the times of darkness may be, no matter how dark it may seem to be around us, no matter even if it seems like the world itself has turned against us, turned upside down and the world is imploding upon us, we have a refuge by an all-powerful and almighty God. It's an amazing, amazing promise. It is a blessed promise and we are blessed people to have it. If you are outside of Christ's family though, that's something that you really can't enjoy. You know, God lays out for us what we must do to enjoy his blessings, to, to partake of these gifts of, of, of comfort and hope and, and, and have the understanding of, 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 of peace that you can't explain. You have that by being one of his children. If you do not have that this evening, we want to help you with it. You know, we're given a very plain and simple plan in his word. You are to hear his word, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then live a, live a holy life. It is through that that we can enjoy that promise of hope and refuge and strength that God makes to us. If you have not made that commitment this evening, I hope that you do so. I also pray that if you are you have made that commitment, but have faltered, and we all stumble. When things get dark, I know those young men question whether they're going to make it out alive, and I would be willing to say there was probably some tears that were being shed inside that cave when they were questioning whether they'd ever live. You know, God loves us. He offers a path for us to get forgiveness, and he will never forsake us. He is our strength, and he is our refuge.
If you would, you please come while we stand and while we sing. Please bow with me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening so thankful for the blessings in our lives. Thank you for the blessings that you, you give us each and every day that we so often take for granted. Thank you for the food that you provide, the shelter we have, the clothes on our back, the drink that we have readily available, Lord. Be with those around the world, the millions that are struggling with those things, Lord, and help them to find those things that they need. Lord, at this time we come to you mindful of Scott's lesson and mindful of the part that sin plays in our lives, Lord. Help us to strive to stand against it, to build up an offense and a defense against sin, using your word, using our Christian brothers and sisters, using prayer, using the tools that you've provided us, Lord. Thank you for never, never giving us a temptation that we cannot overcome. Help us to always find that means of escape and to take it, Lord. We thank you so much for your grace and mercy uh, when we do sin that we have through Jesus Christ. This time we ask that you please be with those that are sick, those that are struggling right now, those that are grieving, that are going through health problems, those that have physical ailments that are recovering from surgeries, please be with them and help us, as we know the individual cases, to be there to comfort and help these people through tough times, Lord. We thank you for our, the mission trip we had recently and help the seeds planted there to continue to grow and, and good work to continue to be done there. This time we ask that you please be with all those that are about to go back to school, be with our young people as they enter into a place where they are in the minority as far as their faith goes, Lord, help them to be strong, to overcome temptations, to be good, shining lights and examples to the people around them as they face their individual trials and temptations, Lord. Be with all of us that are in positions to help and encourage them as well. Please be with those around uh, our congregation that are raising children. Give us wisdom in doing that. Help, them to, help us to raise them to love you and to lean on each other and lean on the examples we have of faithful Christians all around us. Be with our elders of this congregation, Lord. Give them wisdom in the decisions they have to make. Be with the deacons as they strive to help. Be with our ministers and continue to bless and help them in the good work that they do, Lord. We thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to come together as a church family tonight. We thank you so much for this avenue of prayer. We thank you so much for forgiving us of our sins. Please be with those that are lost, those that know that they are lost, that have fallen away, those that have never heard your truth, Lord, help them to find you before it's too late and help us to do our part as Christians in bringing these lost souls to you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to once again welcome everyone that is here with us this evening. Uh, before we are dismissed, we have a few announcements that we need to be aware of.
On our prayer list this evening, Mary Alice Harwell returned to Huntsville Hospital yesterday due to pneumonia and heart failure symptoms. Today, they are decreasing her supplied oxygen and reducing her fluid buildup in hopes that she can move to a regular room. So please pray for that situation. Katie Hamilton is having trouble recovering and adjusting after dealing with her dissected artery. She also has not felt well since and is undergoing various tests to figure out why. Prayers for answers, healing, and strength are needed and appreciated. Also, Leanne Schubert is facing complications with her knees, ankles, and shoulder due to issues with her back. Prayers are needed for healing and relief in that situation. Please keep these and others you know about in your prayers. Some other announcements we have. We are still in need of adult chaperones for our senior high lock-in on August 3rd and 4th. Please see Matthew or Kelly Morgan if you would like to help with the lock-in. This Saturday, our back-to-school devotional will take place at the building from 4 to 6 p.m. Food will be provided. There will be an elders, deacons, and ministers meeting this coming Sunday at 3.30 p.m. Our creation seminar with Mike Houts is coming up. It will take place August 5th and 6th. For those of you that do not know, Mike was a strong evolutionist scientist before he was baptized nearly 20 years ago. Please remember to invite friends, family, and coworkers to this very special event. There are extra flyers on the back table if you would like some to pass out. That is all the announcements I have. Please be sure to read the PowerPoint for our announcements, uh, other announcements and prayer requests. We hope to see everyone back here on Sunday, and we are dismissed.